Picture this. A small group of people seated in glass towers, quietly tapping on computers. With a few keystrokes, trillions of dollars spring into existence. No printing presses, no gold, no limits, just numbers. This is the power of quantitative easing, the modern magic trick that reshaped money itself. Promoted as a tool to rescue economies, in reality, it became the largest wealth transfer in history, moving riches from the poor and middle class straight to the top 1%. Let's rewind to 2008. The global financial system was ablaze, major banks collapsed, stock markets tumbled, millions lost homes and jobs, governments panicked, and central banks like the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England stepped in, the ultimate firefighters. Their answer? Flood the system with freshly created money. Here or SQE in simple terms, central banks buy government bonds and other assets from private banks. In return, those banks receive new digital money, conjured from thin air. The plan? Inject cash so banks lend more, businesses invest and the economy recovers. On paper, it's clever. Stimulate growth by boosting liquidity. But in practice, the results were very different. Instead of reaching the real economy, most of that money stayed trapped in financial markets. Banks bought stocks, bonds and real estate. Investors' portfolios soared while wages for ordinary workers barely moved. From 2008 to 2023, central banks created over $25 trillion through QE. Stock markets hit record highs. Housing prices doubled or tripled in many cities. Billionaires multiplied their wealth. Meanwhile, first-time buyers were priced out, renters paid more than ever, and savers suffered near-zero interest rates. When central banks buy government debt, they make it easier for politicians to spend. That might sound good, but it means deficits grow without raising taxes. And who benefits most? Those who already own assets. The wealthy. QE didn't just boost markets. It rewired capitalism itself. Free market dynamics gave way to central bank control. When the Fed announces QE, markets rise. When it hints at stopping, markets crash. The darker side. Massive money creation distorted values. Bond yields collapsed, pension funds struggled, insurance companies faltered, retirees earned almost nothing on savings, forcing them into risky investments. This is how QE became a stealth wealth transfer. The rich got richer. Those living paycheck to paycheck fell further behind. Economists call it the cannon effect. Money enters the economy unevenly, rewarding those closest to its creation, banks, corporations and wealthy investors. By the time it trickles down, prices have risen. Millennials and Gen Z trying to buy homes now face prices eight to ten times the median income, compared to four times in 2000. Did homes suddenly become better? No. Cheap money drove prices sky high. Corporations borrowed at near zero rates, not to expand or innovate, but to buy back shares. Between 2010 and 2020, U.S. companies spent over $6 trillion on stock buybacks, inflating share prices and enriching executives while worker wages barely moved. Governments were winners too. During the 2020 pandemic, the U.S. borrowed over $3 trillion, nearly 15% of GDP, at historically low rates. But that free money isn't free. Inflation is the hidden tax we all pay. Once QE began, there was no turning back. Every market stumble, every looming recession triggered more printing. 2008 the Eurozone crisis, Japan's deflation, the pandemic. QE became the default, a morphine drip for an addicted global economy. Yet each dose must grow stronger to maintain effect. Markets can't fall without risking collapse. Pensions, jobs, governments. Stop QE, markets crash. Continue QE, purchasing power erodes. The system grows fragile. Easy money didn't just create bubbles, it fostered dependency. Ironically, QE was designed to prevent a Great Depression. Yet by concentrating wealth and inflating assets, it may have set the stage for a bigger one. By the mid-2010s, the influence of central bankers was undeniable. Markets moved with their words. Ben Bernanke spoke. Stocks shifted. Mario Draghi pledged, whatever it takes, billions flowed globally. Japan, S. Abenomics, was no longer just national policy. 
It was a global experiment in monetary manipulation, yet inflation appeared not in groceries but assets. Real estate, stocks, bonds, luxury goods soared. Ordinary people were told there was no inflation, while the wealthy watched their cost of living explode. By 2021, the top 1% owned over 32% of U.S. wealth, the bottom 50%, just 2%. QE didn't reduce inequality, it magnified it. Was this a mistake? Or by design? The system appears built to protect capital holders, not workers. QE makes borrowing cheap, savings worthless, and pushes everyone to speculate in financial markets just to keep pace. Who gained most? Banks sold bonds to central banks, received trillions, and reinvested in markets. Record profits. Massive consolidation. Major U.S. banks grew larger. Smaller banks squeezed out. Corporations borrowed cheaply to buy back shares. Apple alone spent over $400 billion between 2010 and 2020. Governments benefited too. Fed holdings of treasury debt made deficits painless. Investors, hedge funds, and asset managers thrived. BlackRock's AUM tripled. Billionaires doubled globally. For those with capital, QE was a golden age. But for ordinary people, it felt like suffocation. Wages stagnated. Housing, education, and healthcare costs soared. Young people were told to invest early, yet most never could. Retirees saw fixed incomes lose value. Small businesses struggled against corporations with cheap debt. The post-2008 recovery was one of the most unequal in history. Markets boomed, yet half the population didn't own stocks. Then came 2020. The pandemic pushed QE into overdrive. The Fed printed more money in three months than it had in the entire 2008 crisis. Governments unleashed trillions in stimulus. The public cheered, you know, free checks, cheap loans, booming markets. Behind the scenes, the pattern repeated. By mid-2021, inflation surged. Trillions of dollars chased limited goods. Housing, used cars, food prices soared. When inflation became unbearable, the same central banks acted again, this time tightening. Interest rates rose, borrowers struggled, financial instability returned. Boom, bust, bailout, a cycle amplified by QE. The rich thrive in volatility, the poor drown in it. Why not stop QE? The system can't survive without it. QE became the oxygen of global finance. Remove it, markets collapse. Keep it, currencies weaken. In 2023, global debt surpassed $300 trillion, ours, the highest ever. Every new dollar now generates less growth. Economists call it debt saturation. We're borrowing from the future and time is running out. QE was meant to buy time, but it bred complacency. Politicians delayed reforms. Companies chased short-term profits. Investors assumed the Fed would always bail them out. The Fed put. But confidence is fragile. Stop believing in that rescue. And the system unravels overnight. Printed money props up assets while social stability erodes. Wealth and debt coexist at record levels. Stability depends on belief in the magic trick. Yet every trick ends with a reveal. QE is no longer a crisis tool, it's a permanent fixture. Central banks are now the most powerful unelected institutions in history. QE decides who thrives and who fails. A single Fed announcement can create or erase trillions. When the Bank of Japan buys stocks, it becomes a shareholder. ECB bond purchases finance governments. Monetary policy blurs with political power. QE has quietly transformed capitalism into a managed economy dependent on endless liquidity. Free markets exist only when money has a price. QE destroyed that price. Money is supposed to reflect value. Under QE, it doesn't. Trillions are created without production. The link between work, value, and reward is severed. Young people feel effort doesn't matter. The system rewards asset owners, not value creators. Globally, QE causes chaos in emerging markets. Fed dollars flood countries like Brazil, Turkey, Indonesia, raising currencies, harming exports, overheating economies. When the Fed tightens, the money rushes out, collapsing them. QE exported volatility worldwide and reshaped geopolitics. The US dollar as the reserve currency gives America unmatched leverage. But cracks appear. Even central bankers worry. Janet Yellen called QE medicine with unknown side effects. Now side effects are clear. 
inflated markets, moral hazard, distrust in fiat money, people question their savings. Bitcoin and gold rise not as speculation, but rebellion. QE created wealth, not trust, and without trust, money collapses. History is clear. In 1920s Germany, printing money initially calmed markets. Then prices rose. Inflation spiraled. The middle class was wiped out. Digital, global, modern. Today's world differs, but the logic remains. Debt and money creation delay pain, but don't erase it. QE is debt monetization in disguise. Confidence is everything. Once it breaks, the illusion shatters. Some predict QE will evolve into central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, giving total control over money, where it goes, how it's spent, who gets it. Supporters call it modernization, critics call it programmable control. Others warn QE may end only by crisis. Inflation rises, debts unpayable, central banks forced to choose between currency and system. Historically, they protect the system, meaning more printing, more inflation, more wealth concentration. The true cost of QE is psychological. It teaches society consequences can be postponed forever. Debt can grow without limit. Crashes are always fixable with print, but delay only amplifies the reckoning. We live in artificial stability, digital money, debt, faith, and technocrats promising control. Yet control is illusionary. History is unforgiving. In 300 years of financial history, excessive money creation ends the same way. Devaluation, reset, collapse. Rome's silver coins, France's assignments, Germany's marks, the pattern repeats. Easy money buys time, not prosperity. QE is the modern version, the largest, most complex global wealth transfer in history. From the many who earn money to the few who create it. Unprecedented scale, predictable outcome. As central banks continue their experiments, the question remains, how long can a system built on confidence survive when people no longer believe another crisis will come? When it does, everyone will look to central banks, but what happens when even they run out of tricks? If you found this video valuable, Donity forget to like and subscribe for more stories and share anyone who liked that type of content.